what are the key elements that make uh, transformation possible? What does transformation look like? And where do, um, what may also be the places at which uh, uh, churches or religious folks sometimes uh, hinder that process rather than uh, support and encourage it? I think in my own studies, sometimes uh, um, the, the, the gospel has been laid out in a, to a narrative form that then people, um, um, people conform to. Um, and so the trajectory um, kind of moves in this left to right and up movement, right? So I met Jesus. Uh, before I met Jesus, my life was pretty chaotic and crazy. I met Jesus. An event happened. And now my life is, is, is good. Um, and so in some ways, that's really an, that's a, that's an American story um, that's particular to the West. Um, and most redemptive narratives, whether it's rags to riches, whether it's um, Lance Armstrong's story, you know, from their uh, illness narratives, and even redemptive narratives that come out of salvation are patterned around that. Um, what we began to see at Mercy Street is that not everybody's story fit that pattern. Um, and so um, it wasn't the gospel needed to be changed or watered down. It was the, as William, is it Wallace says, or Jim Wallace says, that the problem with American Christianity is just that, it's American Christianity. And so what we needed to do was to let folks that were voiceless teach us about um, what it meant for them to be saved. Because most of the redemptive narratives are based on dominant voices that get to then tell the stories of redemptive narratives. And most of those are around men and white guys. And, right, so, and, and those are legitimate stories as well. There's nothing illegitimate about those. But there's to be told stories that haven't been heard. And so there's, and I think the process of salvation, the process of our own faith is much more chaotic, it's much more contingent, mm -hmm. it's much more, um, it's, it's, it's much more fluid than the narrative constructs that we tell stories in um, allow it to, to be. And ambiguous. And ambiguous, right, right, mm -hmm. right. And I think some of the challenge that that kind of narrative trajectory presents is um, if your story doesn't fit that, then you don't understand yourself uh, in terms of salvation, that you're being saved because I haven't got there yet. Um, uh, or you're like um, uh, someone who says, well, my life was pretty good right. and fine and it wasn't chaotic and I wasn't a drug addict and I was going along and then I met Jesus and it pretty much carried on like it did. And, no one wants to hear that story because it's not, you know, an upward trajectory. It's just, it's not dramatic. And so there, and so people hear this one way of telling the story, and either they don't, if they don't see themselves as fitting within it, then they're they're either left as someone without a story, or that they don't have the right story. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I certainly grew up in a tradition where here there were this series of theological propositions, which if you said I believe those. Um, you know, you give mental assent to these, I believe those things to be true, and I'm going to respond by repenting and, and giving my life to Jesus. And uh, now I'm a Christian. Uh, rather than what I began to see again in Scripture, where th there's this huge epic story. It's not my story. It's not that the story the Scripture tells is not one of uh, God entering the drama of my life to save me. The story is that there is this great drama of what God is doing to save the world, and I get to be a very small part of that story at whatever point where my story intersects with God's story. And as, I be as we began mm -hmm. to talk about that, I discovered that, wow, people, if they begin to hear a story in which there's room for their own story, then they jump into God's story at the point in which their story intersects with it, not at this point necessarily even where they meet Jesus. Um, and, and I remember that this one, we were in the story of God, this, this introductory Bible study that we do, and, and this guy had been coming who um, had maybe 90 days clean off of crack cocaine when he first started coming to the study. And when we got to the week of Jesus on the cross, he pulled me aside afterwards and said, I need to talk to you. Um, and he said, you're telling me that Jesus did that for me, crack addict John, where was that? And uh, I said, well, not just for you, but yes, for you. He goes, I am in. What have I, you know, with some other four-letter words to describe his excitement about that, what have I got to do? And, and I said, well, you know, you could, what you've just said, you know, you could 
return that. And so he prayed this beautiful prayer there in this coffee shop. And then that night, um, something happened. Uh, and he called me the next morning in distress. He said, what have you done to me? What have you done? Again, with some other four-letter words thrown in. And I said, well, t so we got, we got together for breakfast. And I said, well, tell me what I've done to you. Said, well, last night I, I, was, I was on my way home. And I thought, this, this is, I'm going to be different. I'm going to live my life differently. I'm, gonna be, I'm clean and now I'm down with Jesus. And, and I suddenly had this overwhelming urge to use. And I knew I wasn't going to do that. So I thought, I'm just going to go find a, a prostitute and have sex and, and you know, deal with what I'm feeling that way, but I'm not going to use. And he goes, you know, what? I, I went and found one of my favorite women and it didn't work. Like, I didn't enjoy it. So what have you done to me? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, well, that's, you know, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. But we haven't got to that part of the story yet. That's next week when we get to the birth <laughs> of the <church. laughs> and, and it was at that moment when I realized, oh, that people don't have to know it all. They don't have to understand it all. They just have to say, I want in at the story at whatever point I find my story intersecting with God's story. And the rest gets worked out along the way. And, and I want to say that his trajectory was left to right and up, and it wasn't because he relapsed and repetitively relapsed. But he kept coming back. And the story makes us, doesn't make us more spiritual. It makes us more human. Right. Right, and that's what the incarnation tells yeah, us. That's yeah. why we don't have to know the story of God to participate in the story of God. Because where we find true humanity, we find the very presence of Jesus standing in the incognito, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the beauty of this cosmic Christ that is in all, with all, through all, right? That's redeemed all. And so that's the, that's the story that we get drawn into. And as the incognito of Christ steps out of that incognito in the presence of people that know Jesus, there can be that kind of that that waking up in a sense of, 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 a, of a depth. And of a yeah, you kind of move it from something has something is happening to someone is here. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that, that's a shift. <laughs> that's yeah. right. But it takes a while. Yes. And, and, you, and you can't program that. No. You, know, you can't say, okay, now's the time when you have to name that person Jesus and then walk into this. I mean, it's a, right. it's, it's a process and you don't, you know, again, so how can we be with people and be okay with that and just step into their journey with them and I mean we can tell you a lot of stories of Sean was saying you know about the sky but a lot of stories where it's just this confusion it yeah. seems to be a confusion of of faith and I've got this and then you know F them all you know I'm mm -hmm. out you know mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, hardcore stuff. You're just kind of trying to. For me, I'm trying to. I'm trying to find my place in this. You know, and and maybe there's no place to be found. Maybe it's just to be. It's okay. You know, let's receive. Mm -hmm. Let's receive each other where we are, and and keep walking. You know, I love what Sean said about. You know, just keep coming back. Yeah. You know, and it's it's kind of that AA stuff. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. Kind of stuff. You mm -hmm. know, keep showing up. And it's about a day at a time. It's not about a five-year plan. It's about today. And can we translate that kind of thing into our understanding of mm -hmm. what it means to follow Jesus and to walk in faith? You know, it's about today. That's right. Know. I think getting back to part of your question, Chris, uh, are there ways the church hinders people's transformation? And again, you know, my, probably through my friendship with Matt Bonhoeffer has shaped the way I understand some of those things profoundly in his short book, Life Together, mm. and the section on confession, which I think is at the heart of transformation in so many ways. Where he said, the, 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 the problem for the church is that we know how to fellowship as saints, um, but we don't know how to fellowship as sinners. Mm. And so we leave each other alone with our sin because we, 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 we cannot name our sin to each other. Mm. Um, and so the breakthrough to true fellowship doesn't happen and we're left utterly alone with our sin and sin demands to have a person by themselves. And so we can be in the midst of a, a worshiping congregation singing these beautiful songs to Jesus and really mean it. And then the minute we walk out the door, we're confronted with our sin and our aloneness. And that just feels for some of us so, what was that? I've got to come back next week and, and feel that again. That's just going to get me through the week. Because I, but, I, but if those people knew what I was really like, then they wouldn't want me singing mm. along with them those songs. I think it's powerful is what Sean, I know what Sean is saying. Mm. Maybe we, we hinder, the church hinders, by not allowing 
that part of the story to be told in the context of a mm-hmm. church, a worship experience, or the community itself. Mm-hmm. Can we tell the harder story? You know, the story where I struggle to believe or I struggle with God, where I, you know, things aren't going well. Why can't that be the testimony? You know, that we bring, that that's part of, of all of this. And, and that might give some permission or maybe some, maybe some insight into someone who walks out of a worship experience and, and immediately feels the, the, the pressure or even the captivity that they felt prior to coming in. And I say, if I'm saying I got to go back and get what that because there's a certain honesty that occurs and say, well, what I'm feeling is actually maybe God meets me in that too. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have to change that necessarily for God to meet me. That God's mercy meets me in that place too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and then also in, in this, the, the practice we have of, of celebrating milestones in recovery and in life at Mercy Street. You also have people who get up and say, my wife and I have been married for 25 years. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of people, and they get the same amount of applause as someone who's got three days clean off of crack. Because for a lot of people in that room, we need to see people who actually have been doing this for a long time. You know, if my marriage is on the rocks, I need to hear someone say, we've been married mm-hmm. for 25 years. It hasn't been easy, but we're celebrating. Mm-hmm. We need to, if we've got three days clean, we need to hear someone say, I've got 20 years clean. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the, but we need all of those stories to be told, and we need to celebrate all of what God is doing yeah. at both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. And sometimes we need to celebrate the fact that I'm just here. I don't even know if I believe in God anymore, but I do know I, I, I want to not have faith in the midst of this group of people mm. because I, I know that I, this is a safe place for me to acknowledge what's actually happening, what mm. I'm actually thinking, feeling, going through at the moment. Mm. Yeah. There's something that happened too, I think, within our community that really centered around vulnerability. Um, um, and I think that once, and I think that's what AA does quite well, um, or at least um, it, it creates a space for that, is that when people are powerless, when there's something that you have thrown everything against and you cannot defeat, um, um, you give up. And in that giving up, there's a giving up of a lot of things. And so one of the things that, that the 12 Steps Alcoholic Anonymous just um, um, kind of um, just recognizes is that that powerlessness is the beginning point, right? And so when you began, when your story begins at a place not of strength but of powerlessness, then the f- person that shows up that has three days um, sober or one day sober or who isn't sober, or a person that has 20 days, um, there's so much in common about that experience of utter powerlessness. So then what binds us together um, is not necessarily where uh, we are, but where we've come from, and our stories that um, that all break open into that vulnerable space. Um, and so there's a sense in which I think the church could learn a lot from um, AA or recovery programs. It's, it's certain things that the church has just forgotten about, but it's within our heritage because we've made systems out of them, or maybe we just forgot that they, um, it's not about butts and seats and programs. It's about the reflection of the reality in which people live, which is much more messy, um, which is much more complex. Um, the incarnation flips all of that on its head, mm-hmm. turns all of that inside out, and says the down has become the top, <laughs> the outside has become the new inside. You know, there's, in fact, there's, a, it, there's no new inside. Everybody belongs, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a web of relationships, and how do we relate? We relate in vulnerability. Mm-hmm. We relate in weakness. You know, all the things the New Testament teaches us to do, but all the ways we've forgotten to do that in this thing we call church, right? And it almost feels somewhat like whack-a-mole <laughs> when the church has forgotten it, you know, and pushes these kind of systems down. Well, it's going to pop up in the Spirit somewhere because the activity of the Spirit is in the world. Mm-hmm. And now it's, the, it's, it's these folks in AA that have a lot to teach the church about being community and the church, Right? because of their disciplines of confession and meditation and givenness, right? It's not about a program. It's about a web of relationships of givenness. And, it, and it, it's only within that web of relationships and friendships and brotherliness and sisterliness that a lot of what Jesus says begins to make sense. Because if I just read the Sermon on the Mount and hear Jesus tell me, do not be anxious about tomorrow, what you will eat, what you will wear, um, that there's a, there was a time when I read that say, 
wow, if I'm going to be a good Christian, I must never worry about those things. And so if I'm worrying about something, it became this abstract concept. Um, through my experience of being part of communities like Mercy Street, I realized I, was, I don't have to worry about those things because I am friends with people who will not let me be hungry or naked. And so in the very way that Jesus has created mm -hmm. this web yeah. of relationships is, is the fulfillment of, of what Jesus command, how Jesus commands us to live. But as I sit and read this as an isolated individual, it becomes something abstract, this thing called worry that I mustn't do, rather than this lived experience where I can say, I don't have to worry because I have friends, brothers and sisters who won't let me be hungry, who won't let me go naked. Um, and that's a fundamentally different way of experiencing mm -hmm. the good news mm -hmm. and the life that Jesus calls us to do, keep, the, keep all the, you know, observe all that I have commanded you to do. Um, well, the richness of our journeys together has just been uh, seeing how the Lord has continued to use Mercy Street in each of your lives mm. and, uh, and the invitation that it offers to us as a seminary in our own journeys and, uh, and also as a seminary. So mm. sure appreciate you all being here and thanks for the conversation that we've had today.